Okay, well, welcome everybody to this uh, session of uh, Data Science in the News. Um, we're going to talk today about the war in Ukraine and whatever lens we use, whether it be political, whether it be economic, social, or uniquely human, we know that war is a tragedy. But what do we know and what can we say and how do we make decisions about these kinds of conflicts and tragedies? Napoleon Bonaparte said that war is 90% information. And this edition of Data Science in the News webinar series will focus on the war in Ukraine and particularly what role information in the form of data or lack of it in its broadest sense is playing in various aspects of the war. This webinar series is brought to us by the QUT Centre for Data Science and the Queensland Academy of the Arts and Sciences. I'm Kerry Mengerson, I'm Professor of Statistics at QUT and Director of the Centre for Data Science, and it's my pleasure to be the moderator for this webinar. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the Turrbal and Yuggera people as the First Nations owners of the lands where QUT now stands, and also acknowledge the traditional custodians of country from where you're joining us today. I pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging, and recognize that these lands have always been places of teaching, research and learning. So today we have a great lineup of speakers for our webinar. We have Dr. Timothy Graham, Dr. Matthew Sussex, um, Adriana Euphrosina Bora and Dr. Brendan Walker Munro. So we're going, I'm going to tell you a little bit about them as they um, uh, are invited to, to speak. And what we're going to do for this webinar as usual is have um, each person is uh, allocated about five minutes to present uh, from their perspective on the topic. And after the, each person has spoken, then we will have a series of questions. If you have some questions for the speakers, please put them in the chat or the Q&A, whichever one's working, and, uh, and either the speakers can respond to them there or if, we, if time permits, then we can um, uh, come to them at the end. So without further ado, I'd like to turn to our first speaker and that's Dr. Timothy Graham. So um, uh, Tim is a senior lecturer in digital media at the Queensland University of, Techno uh, of Technology. Um, and uh, yeah, okay. Tim, are you, are you an, a senior lecturer or associate professor now? <laughs> senior lecturer still. <laughs> okay, all right. Well, soon to be associate professor, hopefully. Okay, all oh. right, senior lecturer. Uh, his research combines computational methods with social, social theory um, to study online networks and platforms. His current project, Combating Coordinated Inauthentic Behaviour on Social Media, is the topic of his uh, major research at the moment. And he's going to be talking about the Ukraine war that's presented difficult challenges for content moderation on social media platforms and drawing on large scale Twitter data analysis, talk to us about how social media has really become the site of two competing realities about the Ukraine war, both of which cannot be true. So Tim, tell us about this. <clears throat> well, <clears throat> thank you, Kerry. Um, yeah, and thank you to uh, Tim and Becky as well for inviting me to the panel. Um, I mean, this is a difficult subject to talk about at the best of times. And um, the particular lens that I bring to this is looking at the war in Ukraine in terms of social media um, and using uh, data that we can get from social media platforms to understand um, what is, you know, what is happening in relation to the war. I guess, you know, my, the particular angle I come in from is looking at public discussions and deliberation about uh, the war before it began, you know, so this special military operation, um, as it's called by uh, by Putin and the Kremlin, but before that, as you know, um, forces were, were mobilizing along borders, open source intelligence investigators like Bellingcat, uh, disinformation researchers like myself, um, military generals, politicians, uh, intelligence agencies, were all starting to sort of chatter about this, and social media was a really kind of key place for that. But when the invasion began, um, the you know social media exploded, and I think Twitter is 
one of those platforms that's kind of the, in a way, it's sort of almost like the de facto public square. Now, I don't believe that Twitter is a public square. I think that that's a really problematic um, way to, to think about Twitter, especially when I talk about what I'm going to mention in a moment. Um, but I do think that, you know, the, the particular angle that, that I come in here is around, well, what, what do people talk about um, in relation to the war? How do they use social media to connect with news and to connect with information about this? Um, and moreover, what are the kinds of problems associated with this? And I think that's really where my, my DECRA, uh, my um, ARC DECRA project comes into play, where my interest has been always around trying to understand in this space um, for the Ukraine war, how has social media been weaponized by different types of actors in different ways in order to try and shape that conversation, in order to try and um, influence narratives about the war. And I guess, you know, I don't want to kind of just go all in on this and I've only got a few, couple of minutes left to sort of provide some insights here. But I think for, for, for data science, we have a really, like I would call myself a co computational social scientist or a social data scientist, if you like. And I feel like there's a real opportunity um, to, to do what I kind of call the three Ds. So the first is to use data science and to use data collection, data processing and wrangling techniques just to describe what's happening. So who is part of the conversation? How can we collect data to be able to give us a descriptive understanding of the space? Um, and I guess an interesting controversy or, or entry point to description is well, what is actually happening, right? And I, I woke up one morning um, because everything happens in Europe, you know, and in the US and then you wake up and you sort of see what, what, what the heck has happened to your Twitter overnight. And I woke up and there was all this, um, all this journalistic coverage of like this big hashtag campaign, I stand with Putin, uh, this hashtag that was getting hundreds of thousands of tweets. You know, it looked like there was this massive, it appeared like there was this massive widespread support for the invasion. Um, but researchers and Ben Collins and, and other journalists from the NBC had said, well, hold on a second. Actually, I'm not, we're not entirely sure if all of this activity is organic. We're not sure if this is actually authentic public discussion and deliberation about the war. Um, there might be something else going on as well. So, you know, this is kind of where I guess my particular lens comes into play. I, I, I collect large scale data sets I'm developing network science, in particular network science methods that, 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 that try to carefully um, uh, parse that, the, the, the discussions to look for evidence of coordination, you know, to look for evidence of um, actors in the space who are all doing the same types of things in a really short period of time with each other over and over again. Um, and that's the entry point for me to start to get into discernment. So this is, the, this is like my, my, my my simple uh, framework is the 3Ds, describe, um, discern what's happening and then uh, develop defenses for that. Um, so I literally work with, with, uh, with, with um, you know, um, defense agencies around this. Um, but yeah, to discern what's happening. And again, this is where network science and data science really comes into play. Um, being able to uh, collect large scale data sets to do close forensic analysis of clusters of heavily coordinated activity um, and this led to, uh, to me, you know, publishing my research uh, on Twitter and also in, you know, public engagement articles on the conversation. It was picked up by BBC World News. It was picked up by ABC. I'm basically flying by the seat of my pants, trying to advocate, trying to use data science in a careful, um, considered way um, to understand actually what is happening on the ground here. Um, <clears throat> and and how can we make sense of this war? So this information, this data, um, it, it needs to be, you know, kind of carefully curated and it, it does need a, a, a lot of different approaches from qualitative to computational, to signal processing, to text analysis, for statistics, and right through to your very basic kind of um, just describing what's happening. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you know, I really wanted to just kind of open up the space a little bit to, 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 to look at this in a really broad sort of 30,000 foot level that I am a researcher who, um, who, who is very focused on social media here and I'm trying to make sense of what is happening, uh, trying to hold power to account 
you know, trying to understand why Twitter allows, um, you know, about 300 Russian government accounts, embassy um, and, and, and Russian government accounts to more or less, I would say, post uh, propaganda, you know, false um, narratives about the war. Uh, they're trying to mislead people. They're engaging in what I think are really dangerous rhetorical strategies, trying to pretend to be fact checkers, you know, so they're really, I mean, these are really dangerous in the sense that they, they can potentially undermine the, the, the basic tools that we have for understanding what's really happening from turning information into knowledge. And I think that's really icy territory. So, um, you know, I'll kind of close off here because I'm probably well over five minutes, but I, yeah, I just kind of wanted to open up, um, you know, the, the, the conversation to the social media aspect. Um, and it's really, it's a really difficult subject to both to work with and also from a technical um, and analytical point of view, but um, yeah, collaboration, cooperation and information sharing, code sharing, data sharing, I think that's really where it's at. Okay, thanks very much, Tim. And if people want to follow up uh, on, on this with you, um, I'm guessing they can look for you on Twitter. You also have articles like um, publicly available articles in what, the conversation, where else? Yeah, so if you like Google my name in Ukraine, I'll just pop up in a whole bunch of like <laughs> stuff <laughs> lately. It just has completely occupied my life. Um, but I'm reachable on Twitter. So just, you know, just I'm really online. I'm a super online person because I'm a social media <laughs> researcher. Um, so yeah, I'd love to like, uh, yeah, really super keen to connect. And, you know, I call myself a data scientist, but I think the stuff I do is, you know, comparatively very basic to what most folks actually do in the center. So yeah, I'm always keen to, um, yeah, to learn more and to chat with folks. Oh, you do. Awesome. So thanks very much. That was um, fantastic. Yeah. We're going to turn now to um, Dr. Matthew Sussex. Um, and Doc, uh, Matthew is a senior fellow at the Centre for Def um, Defence Research at the Australian Defence College. He's also an associate professor and adjunct at the Griffith Asia Institute at Griffith University. He's a visiting fellow at the Strategic and Defence Studies Centre at ANU, and is a visiting fellow at the Centre for European Studies at ANU. So his research specialisations revolve around national security and strategic studies, with a particular focus on Russia and Eurasia. And he's written several books on this. He holds a range of prestigious roles within the Lowry Institute and the, uh, the for International Policy and um, the Australian Institute of International Affairs. He's regularly invited to speak and brief government, um, academic specialists and think tanks on his area of expertise. And he also provides uh, frequent analyses for local, national and international media, including the BBC, CNN, Bloomberg and others. And so um, Matthew's gonna talk about the war in Ukraine, about the um, crowded information space and um, and what data has to do with the war. So over to you, Matthew. Um, well, thanks so much, Kerry, and, uh, and and thanks for that far too fulsome and, uh, and, and glowing introduction. Um, I'm certain I'm not going to be up to any of that. Um, but uh, look, thanks for having along, me along, folks. And look, unlike a lot of you, I'm, I'm not a data scientist. I'm mainly a strategic policy analyst, but I have a significant interest in uh, propaganda, information war, cyber-enabled misinfo and disinfo and so on. So what I'll do is I'll, I'll share some of the thoughts uh, and just some of the things that we're starting to pick up about how the particularly the information space, but also some things associated with data, with the IoT, uh, are informing the war in Ukraine. Now, I was going to talk about um, the five Vs of big data, which of course we know, volume, velocity, value, variety, veracity. Um, but uh, to be honest, that's uh, too many to cover in five to eight minutes or so, and some of them are boring. So I'm going to focus instead on, on just two of them. Um, it, in terms, just very briefly, of course, uh, in terms of volume, there is an enormous amount of data that gets pumped out, whether it's social media, um, whether it's uh, all sorts of, uh, of electronic data from the variety of military systems that are being used in Ukraine, uh, whether it's citizen-led um, and, and so forth, and uh, it's traveling very fast. Uh, and ultimately, the value of all the data that comes out of Ukraine 
around this conflict is, is highly, highly variable. Uh, but let me focus on, on those things that are particularly interesting to the work I do uh, around disinformation campaigns, political warfare, military strategy. Um, and the first one here is variety. What types of different you know, sources of data are we seeing that are you know, illuminating to some extent? Um, and, and let me just mention a few of them. One of them is uh, GPS tracking and mobile phone geolocation data. Um, this has been really uh, quite interesting in that uh, it reveals a good deal of weakness in the Russian armed forces. They're supposed to have relatively secure communications uh, networks, uh, kit, um, that uh, it turns out doesn't really work very well. So the Russians have been using the Ukrainian cell network to communicate um, often over, over open air. Um, and uh, that's permitted the uh, Ukrainian government and uh, the armed forces of Ukraine to actually identify where Russian troops are moving to and where, they might, where they've been moving from in this conflict, which gives them a particularly useful source of intelligence um, around uh, you know, where the big concentrations are, but also you know, where, some of the, uh, where some of the leaders might be as well. But some other things of, of interest that come out of this, uh, this conflict are, are things like uh, you know, Xboxes and Apple Watches. One of the things we've seen Russian troops do is engage in an awful lot of looting uh, and there have been stories about Apple Watches that have been, you know, activated in different parts of Ukraine, um, and even uh, a story about um, uh, a Russian soldier who uh, looted an Xbox, uh, found out the Ukrainian who owned it, emailed him demanding to know the passcode uh, so that he could play his games. Um, so, you know, the variety of data is really quite interesting, particularly when you take into account um, OSINT, Open Source Intelligence, uh, that can be everything from satellite photos to the geolocation data that I mentioned to things like plane tracking and so forth. The, the thing that I find most interesting, though, probably is, is the social media space. Uh, and this picks up on some of the things that Tim was saying. Um, both countries, both protagonists, both, well, both, both parties to the conflict, Russia is the, uh, the main antagonist, um, are participating in misinformation and disinformation campaigns with, with the very fifth swift spread, uh, I think, of a whole variety of, of different types of misinformation on, on both sides of the conflict. Uh, and this is where the sort of veracity stuff comes in. Um, the accuracy of data that comes out on social media uh, is, again, highly variable because that, of that little sixth V that's sometimes forgotten when we talk about big data. Uh, and that, of course, is voice, um, because the internet provides for a, a level playing field. Everyone's kind of equal. Um, and you see that, that many narratives um, that, that are, in fact, completely false um, are getting picked up to some extent in the West, but also in, in other parts of the world due to the mistrust of mainstream media. Um, so I think there are some patterns emerging in all this, particularly in the social media space. The Ukrainian information campaign is much more specific. It's linked to things happening in the conflict and linked to the objective of boosting morale as well as Western engagement. And there are two examples here. One, the meme about the ghost of Kiev, this fighter pilot who apparently was knocking down uh, Russian jets over Kiev. Um, that's completely fake. He doesn't exist. Um, but also things like um, a lot of messaging around the Eurovision win for Ukraine, targeted very much at the hearts and minds of EU citizens to keep the conflict fresh in their minds uh, and to keep them um, uh, putting the pressure on their political leaders. Because for Ukraine, the very worst thing that can happen um, is that people in the West lose interest. On the other hand, the uh, Russian campaign, and it's much more of a disinformation campaign, it can be targeted. We've seen attempts to spread deep fakes of Zelensky, uh, the Ukrainian president, um, pretending to show that he's fled or that he's been killed or he's been using a body double and so forth. But overall, I think the Russian F effort is, is much broader uh, and it tries to link in with all sorts of false flags and conspiracies, what Rand calls the fire hose of falsehood uh, around Russian propaganda. Um, I don't like that, actually. I, I prefer a sort of sawn-off shotgun of excrement. 
Um, but, uh, you know, all sorts of things that, that the Russian um, uh, government is, is pushing out, conspiracy theories around chemical weapons, CIA bio labs, Ukrainian Nazis, um, the role of uh, Hunter Biden, um, all sorts of denials of human rights atrocities, uh, you know, labeling people crisis actors, uh, and also justifications of Russian actions around the evils of NATO as, as giving it, you know, no uh, option but to invade. Um, and I think while Russian efforts are generally not as successful, uh, particularly in the United States, as in the, say, lead up to the US presidential campaign that saw Donald Trump come to power, um, there is a tendency towards promoting similar types of narratives to entirely different constituencies. And there are a whole array of different citizen curators sharing Russian disinformation. Um, and, and one way to look at that is sort of the form of Baptist bootlegger coalitions. So, you know, during prohibition in the United States, the Baptists didn't want to stop the, sorry, didn't want to, uh, to make alcohol legal because God said alcohol was bad. Uh, but if you're a bootlegger, you also didn't want prohibition to end because you controlled the supply of illicit alcohol. And there are lots of these coalitions emerging. So groups with completely different objectives having similar interests. Good examples are both peace movements, stop the war coalitions, especially in the UK, um, and statist, xenophobic, racist, um, even white supremacist groups are, are, are you know, sharing similar stuff. Uh, just finally, I'll, I'll say a couple of words about uh, geographic spread. Um, the Ukrainian information campaign is much more prevalent in the West, um, but in the developing world, Russian narratives are in fact strongly favoured. Uh, something that we ignore is that, you know, we think that the Ukrainians have the upper hand everywhere. Not so. Um, it's especially so, uh, the Russian narrative campaign is especially strong in places where it can be amplified, um, in Africa, in South Asia, and so forth. And I think also there has been an effort by the Chinese to, to boost Russian narratives, even though in terms of providing actual uh, assistance to the Russian Federation, they're officially remaining neutral. Um, so look, there are just some, uh, some random thoughts I have uh, around the information campaign particularly, but also you know, the role of data in this conflict. Happy to take all sorts of questions from you and uh, look forward to the discussion. Thanks, folks. Okay, thanks very much, Matthew. That's, um, that's excellent. I'm going to turn to our third speaker, and that's um, Adriana um, Boris. So Adriana um, is a PhD candidate at uh, the Centre for Data Science here at QUT, and she has a keen interest in data science and AI applications to progress the sustainable development goals, in particular SDG 8, which is uh, target 8.7, which is focusing on eradicating modern slavery. So Adriana is applying machine learning in analyzing and benchmarking the businesses reports published following the Modern Slavery Acts. And so through her membership to Code 8.7, Data Jam, Traffic Analysis Hub, and the MIT Computational Law Report Task Force on Modern Slavery, she's been working in an international, interdisciplinary, global community, discussing, collaborating in the fight against modern slavery with technological driven solutions. And what's more, Adriana here is a contributor to the Good AI and a community leader of women in AI in Queensland, Australia. She's been awarded, um, she's been awarded um, the International Research Centre on Artificial Intelligence uh, Award under the auspices of UNESCO. In 2021, she was selected as one of the 20 rising stars in AI ethics at, in, um, 2022, and uh, we're very fortunate to have her here to talk about some of the platforms that are su uh, supporting Ukrainian refugees um, that um, might expose or prioritise their safety or risk exposing them to trafficking and exploitation. And she'll bring her reflections also as a Romanian citizen born and raised only a few kilometres from the border with Ukraine. Over to you, Adriana. Thank you very much, uh, Carrie, and thank you for having me here today and part of this wonderful discussion. I just want to confirm, are you able to see my slides? Yes. Perfect. Thank you. Um, so as Carrie um, um, presented, today I'm going to talk about the angle of 
data and the refugees movements um, uh, for people that are flying from Ukraine to the neighboring countries and the role of the platforms that were created uh, to support uh, those people with houses and transportation and other services. And the main points that I'm going to present today are also uh, um, collected in this article that I published with a conversation uh, in April uh, this year. Before uh, diving into the role of the platform, it's important to acknowledge that as this is very much a still developing conflict, to get the exact uh, data and the uh, the numbers of how many refugees uh, exist already is quite difficult. But uh, according to the UNHCR, we have approximately 7 million border crosses from Ukraine um, since the 24th of February, 2020. And then we have around 5 million individual refugees uh, from Ukraine in Europe alone as of the 1st of June, 2020. And we uh, are also expecting these numbers to increase very much. And especially that the conflict is still ongoing, but also at this particular moment, it's extremely difficult to understand the numbers of displaced people within the borders of Ukraine as well. So in when the conflict will be over, we expect this number to be very high. Now, when we talk about refugees, we need to remember that the prof profile of refugees is a profile of vulnerability. And we have evidence from all the for many of the previous uh, conflicts that really showcase that one of the many risks that refugees are facing in their transit to safety is the risk of being trafficked or exploited. In the case of the Ukraine, most of the refugees that are crossing the borders are women, children, and the elderly, because as we know, the conflict is still going, so the men are still required to stay within Ukraine. There are shocking numbers presented by UNICEF saying that a out of those 500 unaccompanied children were identified only between February 24th and March 17th, crossing from Ukraine to Romania. So you can imagine the level of vulnerability that these individuals are facing. With Ukrainian refugees, another uh, vulnerability is driven by the fact that when they are passing to neighboring country, most likely they don't speak the local languages and that creates a communication barrier. They're also most likely going to suffer from post-traumatic stress link disorders, especially the refugees that are crossing now three months into the conflict to the neighboring country. So they've been exposed for quite a while to very horrific situations. So in these times, refugees are at the highest level of vulnerability before they're getting assistance. So therefore, they are in need of protection and support. In the first few days of the invasion, we saw a heartwarming and overwhelming support of in generosity showcased by the people from the neighboring countries of Ukraine. Maybe here I'll take a moment to, as Carrie said, to disclaim that I am born and raised in the Northeast Romania. And since day one, I have been trying to be involved and to keep an eye on the uh, developments across the region. And I have had the opportunity to observe some of the movements and the developments across some Facebook groups and WhatsApp groups where this support was collected. And here I just put forward some messages that I collected this morning for the purpose of this presentation to showcase that the, in this period, there have been some wonderful friendships and connections built between the community of Ukrainians flying to in Romania and the community welcoming them. And those messages are general messages of welcome and thanks from uh, the group United for Ukraine, which in the first two days of the invasion collected more than 100,000 posts. And I think there's still around 20, 200,000 members in this group. And every day you see these wonderful messages of thanks and really heart heartwarming um, uh, collections of stories of people, Ukrainians or students uh, of, or uh, from different nationalities that were in Ukraine and then they passed through Romania uh, moving uh, in their journey to safety. So this has been 
extremely, extremely wonderful to see. And because there was so much support that was ready for people to be given, soon after the, the, the invasion started, there were platforms such as websites and that showed up trying to coordinate all this effort and put, uh, put all the people that want to offer support in contact with the refugees in need. And here are a few examples of some that uh, are created in partnership with the government, such as um, a roof in Romania and some international organizations, the UK um, platform Home for, for Ukrainians, and many private uh, platforms put together um, by a startup or um, a tech um, enthusiasts, um, such as Home uh, House for House for Ukraine, Ukraine Tech Shelter, U uh, Ukraine Shelter Unitado, or uh, EU for, U um, for Ukraine. Now, while this platform truly created the opportunity to, and facilitated this transfer of support from uh, citizens, regular citizens towards uh, Ukrainian refugees, it also opened the door for potential exploitations. So while most of the offers that we see in this platform are well-intended, without the right safety, security, and privacy measures in place, this opened the door for perpetrators to infiltrate. So refugees that are going to these platforms are now, in case the, those methods of safety and privacy are not in, in place, they are exposed to the possibility to have to conduct themselves a background check on the people that they are uh, seeking support from. And again, what we discussed about the vulnerability of the refugees, they should be the last in charge of doing such a hard task of verifying somebody's identity. But at the same time, the other users of these platforms are the people that are giving all their data to, and entrusting this platform with their email addresses, full names, the exact house address picture of their house and family. And we have seen platforms that used to display all this data for anyone without having even to log in or anything. So this data being left to be scraped, sold, and used for fraud and exploitation. And I had in April when I conducted the analysis, I had two platforms in place uh, that I noticed. And then today I was going back to their platform and see that their platform actually now Took a, took a break or they, they're not there. And I don't think it's anything to do with the article, but simply saying that it's so great to see the progress because maybe they stopped presenting the data while they're putting in place some of the safety measures. So the takeaways that I would like to leave you today with are that those who have developed technological solutions to support the refugees should be celebrated but they should also make sure that they partner with governments and with the organizations that have the right expertise to ensure that the services that they're presenting on their platform are adequate, credible, and safe. And that the, when a platform faci is facilitating humanitarian effort, which is a very sensitive um, type of effort, they shouldn't be uh, having the opportunity to ignore safety, security, and privacy, and hide behind terms and conditions and say, well, we're doing this because we, we are in a hurry and we need to present all of those uh, services to the refugees, that those excuses don't hold anymore. We are very it, quite late into the conflict and there is enough time to take a step back and ensure those measures. And the media has a crucial role because a lot of media has been endorsing some of those platforms without stopping and asking vital questions regarding safety, security, and privacy. And then when refugees go to those platforms and they see that type of endorsement, they can create this sense of trustworthiness and then that can create help in the long run. And finally, the match between a refugee and a host should be always recorded and shared with authorities in case it's requ required. Because without this, these platforms are now creating the opportunities for perpetrators to groom, scam, or exploit victims without a trace. And for law enforcement, this is the absolute nightmare as a data point. So with this, I will say thank you, and I look forward to receiving your questions. Uh, thanks very much, Adriana. That's uh, excellent food for thought and very sobering, um, so thank you. We're going to turn now to our last uh, speaker, and that's Dr. Brendan walker Munro. Uh, Brendan is a senior research fellow with the University of Queensland's Law and the Future of War Research Group. 
And his research focuses on examining the frameworks for establishing civil and criminal liability for the use of autonomous weapon systems, both in Australia and internationally. Uh, he's completed a number of appointments in investigation and law enforcement roles across diverse government agencies over 10 years. He's been awarded a Bachelor of Biomedical Science and Bio, um, Molecular Biology, a Bachelor of Neuroscience, a Juris Doctor with Distinction, and also a PhD um, from Swinburne University. So um, he's very well equipped to talk about the use of open source data in future conflicts, um, with particular focus on how it's developed in the war in Ukraine. So I'm going to hand over to you, please, Brendan. Thanks, Kerry. And I think that introduction scares me a little because it makes me sound far more qualified than I actually am. Um, but I'll give it a go. Um, so the, I guess the introduction to the, the work that I do with the uh, Law and Future of War group is I'm, uh, I like to joke and say that I'm the only domestic lawyer in a room full of international lawyers. Um, and so the war in the Ukraine, um, although on a, a human level is, is extremely tragic and, and horrifying and really is just something that was entirely avoidable. Um, it's also something that has given um, a lot of us and, and those in this room or this virtual room, um, a lot of um, insight into the way that, that conflicts really are gonna play out um, at least in the short term or the, the near future. So there's three things that I wanna cover. The first is the, the rise, and I think Matthew was the first to say this, of open source intelligence versus um, that what would be traditional military or, or even covertly gathered intelligence. Um, and the start, Kerry mentioned that Napoleon said war is 90% information, and that still holds true even now. Um, so if you think about if, if the, the first Gulf War was at the time the most televised, um, the Ukrainian war is now really the one that is both using, consuming, but also generating some of the largest sets of data that we've ever seen. Um, and there's a reason why they're calling it the first TikTok war. Um, in, in previous conflicts, you used to have to have potentially people on the ground, you'd have to have reconnaissance, you'd have to have all of these sort of military assets um, sort of sneaking around behind enemy lines, trying to find out where they are and what they're doing and also concealing where we are and what we're doing. Um, you don't need to do that now um, when you can open up Google Maps and essentially pick out where the Russian tanks and trucks are actually moving uh, until they manage to disable that service for doing exactly that. Um, so open source intelligence um, is not, I don't think, ever going to replace that important military intelligence role. It's still going to be there. Um, but militaries around the world are going to have to pivot very quickly to kind of take on this OSN um, background and start to find ways to use it and to use it really sensibly uh, because there's a lot of information, there's a lot of detail there that you can get to. Um, the second thing that I want to raise is, um, and again, this is from a sort of a legal context, is this blending of military and civilian platforms and data during conflict. And it raises a lot of um, really hard to answer questions about um, how that data can be used, who it can be shared with, um, how, for example, you then even go down the path of, say, for example, targeting a server or targeting a computer that might have military information on it, but it might have civilian information as well. Um, and if you think about, again, this is the first TikTok war that we're seeing, um, the first and second Gulf War, um, even for both of those, Facebook didn't exist. Um, when you look at the war in Afghanistan, the kind of prevailing infrastructure for internet and mobile services wasn't the greatest. And so there was the startings of this data beginning to emerge then, but it certainly wasn't at the level that we're seeing in the Ukraine where you've got two industrialized countries in conflict with a, a very prominent um, not only open source intelligence, but also a very prominent cyber and um, telecommunications aspect to the conflict that really we've never seen before. Um, and I think the easiest way to look at this is um, the use of Clearview AI by Ukraine. Um, now, Clearview AI, for those you probably already know, um, is of some infamy 
for being fined um, quite heavily by a variety of European Union, UK, Australian institutions for scraping social media um, and conducting facial recognition for things that we all probably didn't think at the time. Um, and the Ukrainians were originally using this to identify um, their dead soldiers for the purposes of things like war graves, uh, identifying dead civilians potentially for future war crimes prosecutions. Um, and then they started identifying dead Russian soldiers and notifying their Russian families before the Russian military bureaucracy could do it, and essentially conducting psychological operations uh, using Clearview. Um, so this is where, again, you, you're seeing the blending of the military and the civilian platforms during conflict. Um, and one of the biggest things that um, comes about here is um, some of the research I'm doing at the moment into this concept of the thing called a splinter net. Um, when they first invented the internet, for example, it was supposed to be the big global common. It was where everybody could come and share ideas and everything else. Uh, but essentially what we've now got is each different state has kind of imposed its own strictures on the internet and how it operates. So if you go to Russia, um, they don't use Google very much. They use things like Yandex and IUNet. Um, and there's even some unconfirmed reports that Russia has gotten to the point with its own infrastructure that it could essentially cut off the internet and just run its own locally hosted internet, um, in which case it could just tell its civilians whatever it liked, um, which is a little concerning. The last theme that I want to close on um, is the, the theme that kind of we're only starting to see now, but is again going to pick up, which is the use of open source data in potential war crimes prosecutions uh, and investigations. So um, the first war crime prosecution was only a couple of weeks ago in the Ukraine for a 21 year old soldier uh, who shot a 62 year old. Um, he got life in prison, quite unsurprisingly, um, but there was CCTV information that showed essentially that the victim's appearance immediately before they died. And it's very, very clear. They are a civilian. They pose no lethal threat at all. And they were shot because they were in the wrong place at the wrong time. Um, Tim mentioned the, the work of Bellingcat. Um, so again, this is an organization that is already contributing to gathering that sort of information. And whether it's collecting the information more broadly in terms of that, that visual evidence, um, but also verifying it and making it clear that it is an acceptable piece of visual evidence and that it hasn't been deep faked, that it hasn't been um, subject to some modification. Um, so I think that that's a, a kind of a watch this space development. I think that the use of that um, open source and kind of almost crowdfunded investigations is going to come to um, a head probably over the next few months and years as those war crimes prosecutions start to get underway and start to get to their, their natural conclusions. So thank you very much, Kerry. Uh, thank you very much. That was great, Brendan. Okay, um, we come to the, the, uh, the, the end of the, the, the presentations and come to some questions. Now I'm going to ask a couple of questions, but I'm also then going to, um, to turn it to um, the panel members to ask one of the other panel members a question. So this is just a, so a heads up. So think about this. And I haven't, for, any, for the people who are listening, we haven't practiced this at all and they, the panel members didn't know this was coming. But I think there's a lot of synergy between the, the discussions that we've heard and um, and I'm thinking that there can be some, some nice interaction that can happen between the, the uh, panel members. But I'm going to start off first by just asking an open question to, to the panel, which is that when we've been talking in these discussions, it's a lot of it's been around, um, you know, what was historically the case in, in war and now what is the, what's, what's different in war now with respect to data and information. But what I'm also interested in is we, we have sort of non-war situations and we then have war situations. And so what I'm interested in is, What's the what's the difference in the the data that's being um, uh, that's playing out as being important in in sort of the the war situation as compared to like non-war situations? And I'm going to start with Matthew. Yeah, thanks a lot, Kerry. Um, look, I'll I'll pick up on on one area where I think that that data is having a, an important effect, um, and that's in Ukraine's ability to raise funds. Um, and in particular, Zelensky's ability to uh, push uh, leaders in the United States, in, uh, in the European Union, 
to you know uh, agree to large amounts of support for the war and you know, the reason for that is that uh, there is a large amount of communication um, between not just the Ukrainian government um, and the American government on where there have been war crimes and uh, you know sharing of intelligence and so forth but uh, as all the panelists have, have really mentioned this sort of crowdsourced um, information that, uh, you know, um, you know the, the sort of, it might not be the first TikTok war, I think Nagorno-Karabakh, or at least, you know, Azerbaijan-Armenia was probably the first TikTok war, this might be the first, second, uh, or the uh, the first proper TikTok war. Now, I think it's, it's having a, a significant motivating effect on populations, particularly in the West, because let's face it, if Russia had won its military conflict in three days, like it intended to, um, there wouldn't have been um, there wouldn't have been such a, a groundswell of support. And I think this is something that really, you know, Zelensky has managed to weaponize, if you like, as part of a, a sort of information campaign, uh, which appeals very much to people in the democratic West um, who, uh, you know, are, are used to populists being rampant xenophobes or, you know, statists and, and, and so forth. So I think the ability to spread this idea of Ukraine as a peaceful democracy, um, which I mean it was, but but let's face it, it had huge problems with corruption as well. Um, but the ability to create this narrative in the West has, has been something that has not just been done at the top level of diplomacy, but has really reached down into, into sort of citizens um, across the West. And I think that's probably been one of the most potent outcomes for Ukraine to, to help it remain in the conflict. Okay, great, thank you. Um, Brendan, what about you? Um, so I think the, there's, there's been a couple of things and uh, it's interesting that you talk about the difference between war and, and non-war approaches. Um, certainly from a legal perspective, there's a, a obviously very different framework that applies around that sort of conduct. Um, I think one of the things that, um, and certainly something I am still unclear myself on, is things like um, the use of biometric information in both conflict and non-conflict scenarios. Um, and it was something that um, in Afghanistan, the, the US and the Canadians were, were very comfortable with sort of taking biometric information from people and saying, well, okay, you know, are you, <coughs> excuse me, uh, Al Qaeda or ISIS, or are you a threat, um, or are you a, a civilian who's been caught up in this? Um, and there really wasn't a lot of conversation about whether actually doing that was e even legal. Um, and I think that then doing that sort of thing in a, um, a non conflict space, even something like providing security or, or providing some kind of humanitarian assistance, it again gets really dicey and, and kind of concerning because potentially you've got the military then collecting all of this biometric information, but where are they storing it? How secure is it? Um, you know, taking Adriana's point from earlier, um, how likely is it that someone could get access to that information and use it for fraud or exploitation? Like they're, they're all questions that kind of, no one's really gotten to grips with quite yet. Um, and is something I think is, is certainly gonna come up in the future. And certainly is something that we've, we've seen very small snippets of during the Ukraine conflict as well. Okay, thank you. Okay, I'm going to ask um, Tim, um, what's, what's, if you had your, your druthers, so if you were to um, be able to choose any kind of data source that would be most helpful to you, what would you say? Like what's missing that would be most valuable in, in the work that you're looking at? I think that's a, you know, that's a, that's a heck of a question. Um, um, and I'd have to think deeply about it to give you a, um, an informed answer. But I think, I, I guess from where I'm sitting, one of the most difficult problems studying disinformation, and perhaps Matthew and maybe Brendan could talk a bit about this as well, is the problem of attribution. And so, you know, when, um, you know, when I do analysis of, um, you know, really suspicious, highly statistically significant um, uh, uh, um, evidence of coordinated inauthentic behavior, you know, so like it looks like a duck, it smells like a duck, it quacks, flaps, swims like a duck. It's, it's got to be, you know, a duck, but we can't know for sure whether these thousands and thousands of accounts on, say, Twitter, for example, that are spreading 
false narratives of various different kinds. And Matthew kind of went through a few of the, you know, the, the usual tropes. Um, whether they are actually uh, originating, you know, uh, from uh, Kremlin sources, whether they're linked to Russia, whether they are, you know, an internet research agency type place, or whether it's a false flag operation, or whether it's like, you know, uh, fringe civil society individuals, things like that. So we just, attribution is a super hard problem. So I guess, you know, I'm going to sort of lob a grenade out there, so to speak. Sorry, that's a terrible metaphor. But um, I'm going I'm to say I would love to get access to data from inside, um, like the FSB, inside uh, security agencies and intelligence agencies and within the Kremlin itself, because it would be, um, it would make life a lot easier and it would make the work of studying um, disinformation in a meaningful way, it would, it would make it easier if we were able to actually access the communication and the um, and the internal dialogue to see what's actually happening. So this is, you, you asked a question where we could wish for anything. Um, and, you know, I think, yeah, emails from Putin, or he wouldn't use email, but, uh, you know, <laughs> um, you know, but because he's, you know, we won't go into that, but, uh, you know, letters, um, missives, things like that, um, communication from inside, um, from inside uh, uh, the Kremlin would be, I would love that. Okay, thank you. All right, Adriana, what about you? What's missing and what would you like most? In terms of the data regarding, yeah. well, I think for us um, in the working in the field of human trafficking, um, I think we have already um, an issue of collecting uh, data and being able to um, identify the real incidents and cases um, because this is a crime and it's a hidden crime. And um, in this particular context, unfortunately, Eastern Europe is quite well known for uh, having well-established networks of um, human trafficking. So when this um, um, war started and in the absence of government um, organized um, activities to at the borders and to, to be able to welcome the, the refugees, uh, this offered an incredible opportunity for those networks to dive in and then um, now months into the conflict, we see the law enforcement agencies trying to piece back, the, put back the pieces and to try to identify how many people cross the borders, where they are, are they with a, in a safe environment, um, are, did they move towards the West or come all the way to Australia or where are the people and what are their conditions? So I think any data and accurate data in that regard will be amazing to, to have, but I know it's very difficult. Okay, oh, thank you. Yes, and I think the uh, talking to um, you know, international official statistics agencies around even trying to get the usual official statistics for countries in in um, when there's these kinds of conflicts, and of course that that permeates out to um, countries that are more indirectly affected, uh, then that can be very very difficult in these in these times as well. And so the, I know that a, a lot of the official statistics agencies are resorting to other means for collecting. This kind of really crucial information uh, about the country. Okay, I'm going to now ask uh, very quickly, Adriana, would you like to ask any of the panel members a question? Sure. So um, I was thinking since you put this out there, just um, regarding um, for the panelists, um, as researchers here in Australia, generally working in, in English, how do you deal with the challenges of using social media data from Ukraine, Russia, Romania, or Poland, all with very complex and very difficult languages? Do you have people in your team that speak the local language or have the local knowledge, or do you rely heavily on technology and is the technology advanced enough to, to, to be able to, to deal with those very complex languages? I'm curious to, to learn from your experience. I, I can give a, a really simplistic answer, Adriana, which is that um, no, no one that I'm aware of in our team speaks the local languages. Um, they, they may, and it's a hidden talent that hasn't come up in conversation. Um, and so predominantly though, if, if it was 
something that we were trying to, you know, um, use for a, a research purpose, we'd obviously try and get to a primary source that's verifiable from some mechanism. Um, and essentially, we really don't want to have to rely on Google Translate ever for obvious reasons. Um, and so I guess the, the answer is we try to avoid having, having to deal directly with the um, complexities of language if we can. Um, but if we can't, then it's just a case of saying, well, what's the, what's the most easily verifiable way we can get to this content in English? But it's a great question. Okay, thank you. So, so Brendan, do you want to ask anybody a question? This will be the last question. Uh, right, no pressure or anything. Um, I was going to um, ask Matthew and, and potentially also Tim whether um, you see a place for things like um, disinformation and misinformation campaigns, the kind that Russia potentially are engaging in at the moment, um, may be being used by an adversary slightly closer to our own doorstep um, and sort of in the Indo-Pacific region. Yes, um, <laughs> of course. That was um, an easy one. <laughs> yeah, look, um, uh, China is, I think, a, a, and I'll say the name, um, China is, I think, on the one hand, uh, is more blunt than Russia in terms of cyber attack um, and is more visible. Uh, so, I mean, this is a truism around Canberra that the things that we see are Chinese and we see them every day. The things we don't see or if we think there are some traces of probably Russian, um, that's in that's that's strict cyber attack. But when it comes to things like inf misinformation, disinformation campaigns, um, I think the way that China's gone about it in the past has been to um, I'd characterize it in the past as being quite defensive um, to take the uh, diaspora network to monitor it through WeChat, various other forums, uh, and to say things uh, and to say things like, okay, where are the potential bad apples here who are starting to say things about democracy? Uh, and starting to do uh, explicit or implicit criticisms of Xi Jinping or the CCP. Um, and then uh, everybody piles on and, and you sort of cauterize, you know, the, um, the wound to, uh, to, to the diaspora. Um, I think now that's changing and I think it's becoming much more offensive in nature as a way to sort of manipulate populations. Um, so, so that'd be my, my take on it. Um, just to answer very quickly, Tim's question about, you know, where can we find, can we find it, the FSB, you know, um, um, in what they say to one another, there, there's a clue in terms of the IRA, you're probably familiar with it, but it's the Department of Justice indictment of the, uh, of the IRA with instructions to Russian trolls um, prior to the 2018 midterms. Um, and that's fascinating, absolutely fascinating stuff as a kind of insight into the types of ways that Russian trials push this stuff out. Okay, thank you. Um, unfortunately, we have to draw this to a close. We've come to the end of our time for the webinar. And on behalf of the audience, then I want to thank all of our speakers. It's been great and we could go for another couple of hours, I'm sure, maybe days on this, um, but it's been very, very informative. It's been thought provoking um, and it's been a great discussion about the role of data in the many perspectives of war in general and the war in Ukraine in particular. So data is the informant and it is the enabler for generating insights, raising awareness and making decisions in conflict situations. However, we're also very aware that in any conflict, there are people. And to all those who've been and who are still being affected by war, we send you our thoughts and our support. And we hope that our small efforts in some way will help. So I'd like to thank Becky and Tim for their help in organizing this webinar and the CDS and um, the QAAS for supporting the, um, the Data Science in the News series. Our next webinar is scheduled for Friday the 1st of July, 12 to 1 p.m. We're going to showcase some data-focused research by some of our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander uh, colleagues in advance of NAIDOC week. So I look forward to meeting up then. And until then, bye for now. <laughs>